Hi guys! Welcome to another episode of Attorney Javier's Law Lectures for Students. For today's episode, I'll be giving a brief overview of the Anti-Money Laundering Act of the Philippines or AMLA for short. So if you like my videos and you want to see more, please hit that subscribe button. Also, please remember that this is only for educational purposes and is not a substitute for proper legal advice or for studying and understanding the law. A like on this or any of my other videos would also be greatly appreciated. Now, let's begin. The governing law for AMLA in the Philippines is Republic Act or RA number no. 9160 as amended by later laws, specifically RA 9194 which took effect in 2003, RA 10167 in 2012, RA 10365 in 2013, RA 10927 in 2017, and the latest RA 11521 which took effect in 2021. Now I have compiled a list of the latest uh, amendments to AMLA as of 2023 and you can check it out in script. Uh, you can download it for free and the link is in the description below. Now, why have there been so many amendments? Well, as criminals find ways to circumvent the law, to evade prosecution and punishment, then the crime of money laundering evolves. So, too, must the law evolve to effectively deter, prevent, and punish those involved in the crime of money laundering. Due to the rapid evolution of money laundering and in order for the Philippines to remain compliant with global policies, it is highly likely that Philippine law may see even more amendments in the future. And that is mainly why today's discussion is designed only as a general overview, focusing more on the essential concepts of the crime of money laundering rather than on the details which may change due to future amendments. Thus, existing and future amendments to AMLA seek not only to strengthen Philippine law on anti-money laundering but also to ensure that the Philippines remains globally competitive and compliant. And this is reflected in the declared policies of AMLA as amended which are first, to protect and preserve the integrity of and confidentiality of bank accounts, second, to ensure that the Philippines shall not be used as a money laundering site for the proceeds of any unlawful activity. Third, to cooperate with transnational investigation and prosecution of persons involved in money laundering or uh, money laundering activities wherever they may be committed and to cooperate in the implementation of targeted financial sanctions in relation to the financing of terrorism. So what is money laundering? Do not take this literally because of course the money is not actually being washed with detergent. No, Rather, this is just a figure of speech to refer to the criminal process of washing or laundering dirty money to make it clean or, at the very least, to give it the appearance of looking clean by making it appear to come from legitimate sources. This money that needs to be cleaned is dirty because it was obtained from, represents, involves, or relates to the proceeds of the unlawful activities or predicate crimes enumerated under the AMLA. Now, this list of unlawful activities is very long, as of now consisting of 36 predicate crimes having been expanded by the amendments from the original 14 crimes under the first version of the Philippine law. As I mentioned earlier, as both the crime and the law continue to evolve together, it is highly likely that more crimes may be added by future amendments. Since future amendments are highly likely and for lack of time to go through the whole list of crimes, I will not be discussing each of those crimes in detail. However, some examples of those predicate crimes include kidnapping for ransom, sale, use, possession, manufacture, and other crimes involving illegal drugs, violation of the Anti-Graft and Corrupt Practices Act and plunder, 
robbery and extortion, estafa, destructive arson, murder, terrorism, and financing of terrorism, among others. Now, you can just read section 3, paragraph I, of the, for the full list of the predicate crimes in the compiled document of AMLA amendments that I have made. And again, link is in the description below. You can download it for free. Now, the prosecution and punishment for the crime of money laundering is separate for, from, that for, from that for each of the predicate crimes so that the criminal can stand trial and serve sentence for two or more offenses, namely money laundering and whatever the predicate crime is that they committed to get the dirty money. Okay? Let me illustrate now how money laundering works. So, let's say a criminal commits a crime. Let's say they sell illegal drugs. The money received as payment for those drugs is dirty money. Why? Because it came from the crime of selling illegal drugs. Or, let's say the criminal kidnaps a person for ransom. The ransom money in that case is dirty because it was obtained from the crime of kidnapping. Now, the criminal has the dirty money and assuming that they have not yet been arrested, they cannot just suddenly spend or even deposit big amounts of money because a sudden or unexplained increase in income or radical spending that is not consistent nor commensurate with the known lifestyle or income may create suspicion and this may trigger investigations leading to the identification, arrest, and imprisonment of the criminals as well as the forfeiture of the dirty money. This is because under the criminal law of the Philippines, not only will the criminal suffer the penalties of imprisonment and or a fine, Article 45 of the Revised Penal Code provides that the proceeds of the commission of the crime, meaning the dirty money in this case, shall be confiscated and forfeited in favor of the Philippine government. So, the criminal resorts to money laundering to make it appear that the dirty money from the crime came from a legitimate source to avoid triggering investigations which may lead to their arrest or even if they get caught and imprisoned so that their dirty money will not be confiscated by the government and they can enjoy it after they finish their prison sentence or escape. And that is why the law punishes money laundering, not only to punish, but also to deprive criminals of the enjoyment of the fruits of their criminal activity, namely, the dirty money. So how do uh, criminals, how exactly do criminals perform or commit money laundering? In general, there are three stages, uh, placement, layering, and integration. In the first stage of placement, the criminal introduces the dirty money into the financial system, often by placing the funds into circulation through formal financial institutions such as banks or through other legitimate businesses, whether domestic or international. The second stage of layering consists of the separation of the dirty money from their source by layers of financial transactions which are intended to conceal the origin of the dirty money. In this stage, the criminal begins to hide the fact that the money came from a crime. How? By subjecting it to a transaction or series of transactions to create confusion as to the real source and ownership of the funds. In the third stage of integration, the launderer now gives the dirty money the appearance that it has come from a clean source. The dirty money is given apparent legitimacy by allowing it to re-enter the economy through seemingly normal, regular, legitimate, or personal transactions, such as when the launderer buys real estate like condominiums, jewelry, I have even heard of paintings, or actually anything else. And this is the crime of money laundering per se. 
involving the three stages of placement, layering, and integration of the dirty money, which are the proceeds of an unlawful activity. Specifically, paragraphs A and B of the amended Section 4 of AMLA define and punish the main act of money laundering, which we can simplify for this discussion as simply use of the dirty money. Under these provisions, a person is liable for money laundering if they know that the monetary instrument or property represents, involves, or relates to the proceeds of any unlawful activity and they either transact, convert, transfer, dispose of, move, acquire, possess, or use that said money, monetary instrument or property. However, there are other acts that AMLA treats as money laundering offenses even though they may not strictly be the actual act of cleaning the dirty money. These acts include concealing, aiding, facilitating, attempting, or conspiring to commit money laundering and even failing to report covered or suspicious transactions to the Anti-Money Laundering Council or AMLC. These acts are expressly considered as money laundering offenses and are punished because they either directly or indirectly cause, promote, or facilitate the crime of money laundering. Thus, a person may be held liable for money laundering even if they did not actively commit the act of money laundering itself by using or transacting the dirty money if they perform any of the following acts which are considered money laundering offenses. First, we have concealment of the dirty money under paragraph C of the same section, under which a person is considered to have committed a money laundering offense if they know that the monetary instrument or property involves or relates to the proceeds of any unlawful activity, but they conceal or disguise any of the following. First, the true nature of the dirty money, meaning they hide the fact that the money is dirty because it came from a crime. Or, they conceal or disguise the source of the dirty money, its location, its disposition, or how it was used. Or fifth, the movement of the dirty money as when it is uh, circulated, transacted, or transferred. Or sixth, the ownership or the rights to the dirty money. So, any person who conceals or disguises any of those matters is liable for a money laundering offense. Next, the law considers money laundering to be so grave a crime that paragraph D of the same section punishes even the mere attempt to commit money laundering by transacting, using, or concealing the dirty money. To emphasize, even if money laundering itself is not committed because the perpetrator was prevented from performing all the acts necessary to commit money laundering, by some cause or accident other than his own spontaneous desistance, the law still considers the mere attempt to commit money laundering as being the crime of money laundering itself, as if money laundering was actually committed. Thus, instead of lowering the penalty as is usually done for attempted crimes, a mere attempt to commit money laundering will be punished with the penalty for money laundering in its consummated or completed stage of execution. Again, a mere attempt to commit money laundering is considered a money laundering crime. Now, even if a mere attempt is punished, the more so when several people work together to commit the crime of money laundering. The same paragraph D punishes conspiracy to commit money laundering which is committed when several persons come to an agreement and decide to commit a money laundering crime by generally using, transacting, or concealing the dirty money. 
Such conspiracy is specifically considered as a money laundering offense and each of the perpetrators will be held primarily liable as a principal for the crime of money laundering. Now, these particular acts of money laundering are punished with a penalty of imprisonment of 7 to 14 years and a fine of not less than 3 million pesos but not more than twice the value of the dirty money. However, the penalty is lower for acts which merely facilitate the crime of money laundering under paragraphs E and F of the same section. Specifically, even if a person does not actually perform the act of using, transacting, or concealing the money laundering, they will still be liable for a money laundering offense if they know that the monetary instrument or property involves or relates to the proceeds of any unlawful activity and they aid, abet, assist in, counsel, or otherwise perform or fail to perform any act as a result of which they facilitate the commission of money laundering, specifically of using, transacting, or concealing the dirty money. The penalty for the commission of these acts is imprisonment of 6 months to 4 years or a fine of 100,000 pesos to 500,000 pesos or both. The same lower penalty also applies to the last form of money laundering which is committed by any covered person who, knowing that a covered or suspicious transaction is required to be filed with the Anti-Money Laundering Council or AMLC, fails to submit such a report. Take note, however, that this particular form of money laundering can only be committed by covered persons. And who are these covered persons? Now, due to the length of that discussion and time constraints, I will talk about covered persons and their obligations under AMLA in a separate episode. Though, I will give a brief discussion here. AMLA does not give a specific de de definition of covered persons and instead gives us a very long list of who are to be considered as covered persons. Nevertheless, we can define covered persons as those natural or juridical persons upon whom the AMLA imposes various obligations to prevent money laundering. While the list of covered persons is long, we can nevertheless categorize them under four groups, namely those under the supervision of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, those under the Insurance Commission, those under the Securities and Exchange Commission, and covered persons who are designated non-financial businesses and professions or DNFBPs. Now, while waiting for the episode discussing covered persons and their obligations, you may read Section 3, Paragraph A to see the full list of covered persons in the compiled AMLA amendments that I made, link in the description below. Now, while AMLA and its IRR impose several obligations on covered persons, the three main ones are those imposed for the prevention of money laundering, namely customer identification or due diligence, record keeping, and reporting of covered and suspicious transactions. In brief, Customer Due Diligence or CDD involves identification, verification, and risk profiling of customers of, co of covered persons to determine whether to open, maintain, or terminate their accounts and to assess the level of monitoring to be applied to those customers. This is sometimes referred to as the framework of KYC or know your customer or know your client. In this regard, covered persons are required to maintain their customers' accounts only in the true and full name of the account owner or holder. As such, the following are expressly prohibited accounts. Anonymous accounts accounts under fictitious names, 
numbered accounts, meaning those accounts identified only by numbers except for non-checking numbered accounts and all other similar accounts. Now, the second obligation of record keeping requires covered persons to maintain and safely store all records of all transactions for five years from either the date of each respective transaction or from the dates when the accounts were closed or even beyond five years in case there is a pending case until the AMLC gives confirmation that the case has been terminated with finality. Failure to comply with this obligation of record keeping is punishable with imprisonment of six months to one year or a fine of 100,000 to 500,000 pesos or both. Under the third obligation, AMLA requires covered persons to file two kinds of reports with the AMLC, namely covered transaction reports or CTRs and suspicious transaction reports or STRs. And I will discuss these more in the next episode. But briefly, the difference is that in CTRs, you look for transactions that exceed the thresh threshold amounts. While in STRs, you don't look at amounts. You file an STR when there are sur suspicious circumstances surrounding the transaction. Specifically, CTRs have to be filed within 5 working days from occurrence of the covered transactions listed in the AMLA. In general, cash transactions of more than 500,000 within a single day or a single cash transaction of more than 5 million pesos for casinos only or for more than 7 million 500,000 pesos for real estate developers and brokers only. Okay? So if they're not casinos or real estate developers, the threshold amount is more than 500,000 pesos in a single day. STRs, on the other hand, must be filed within the next working day from the occurrence of any transaction regardless of the amounts involved where any of the following suspicious circumstances are present. First, there is no underlying legal or trade obligation, purpose, or economic justification. Second, the client is not properly identified. Third, the amount involved is not commensurate with the business or financial capacity of the client. Fourth, taking into account all known circumstances, it may be perceived that the client's transaction is structured. To in order to avoid being the subject of the reporting requirements. Fifth, any circumstance in the transaction which deviates from the profile of the client and or the client's past transactions with the covered person. Sixth, the transaction is in any way related to an unlawful activity or offense under AMLA that is about to be, is being, or has been committed, or the last uh, catch-all provision, any transaction that is similar or analogous to any of the foregoing suspicious circumstances. So if those suspicious circumstances are present in the transaction, the covered person has to file a suspicious transaction report within the next uh, working day. Now, in case the transaction breaches the 500,000 peso threshold and there are suspicious circumstances, the covered person should first report it as a covered transaction, then update that report once it is finally confirmed to be an STR. Again, the obligation to file these reports is mandatory such that the failure of covered persons to file these reports with the AMLC is punishable as a money laundering offense. Now, as long as the reports are made in the regular performance of duties and in good faith, then such reporting will not be considered to have violated the Data Privacy Act or any other bank secrecy law because AMLA is expressly made an exception to those laws. 
and no administrative, criminal, or civil case can be filed against the covered person, its officers, or employees for merely filing such a report. And this is known as the safe harbor provision. However, the safe harbor provision does not apply if the reports are filed in bad faith, such as to harass, intimidate, or blackmail a customer or account holder, in which case the person shall be punished with malicious filing of reports, which carries the penalty of imprisonment of 6 months to 4 years, or a fine of 100,000 to 500,000 pesos, or both. In line with this, covered persons, their officers, and employees have the duty of confidentiality. And they are prohibited from directly or indirectly communicating in any manner or by any means to any person or entity, especially the media, any information about the CTRs or STRs, including the contents thereof or even the fact that such a report has been filed. AMLA further prohibits the publication or airing of those reports in any manner or form by mass media, electronic mail, or other similar devices. And violation of this prohibition is punished by imprisonment of 3 to 8 years and a fine of 500,000 to 1 million pesos. Now, let's say there is evidence of certain acts which give rise to a reasonable belief that money laundering has been committed. What can we do then? What are the legal remedies under AMLA? In general, the legal remedies under AMLA include bank inquiry by the AMLC, freeze order, civil for future proceedings, and of course, prosecution of the money laundering offense itself, which is separate from prosecution for the unlawful activity or predicate crime, which gave rise to the money laundering. Now, I will not be discussing these legal remedies in detail for lack of time, and I will instead discuss them in a separate episode. However, briefly, bank inquiry refers to the authority of the AMLC and BSP or Banco Central to inquire into and examine deposit, investment, or related accounts if there is probable cause that the deposits or investments involved are in any way related to an unlawful activity or money laundering offense. To obtain such authority to uh, conduct bank inquiries, the AMLC may apply for a court order or in certain specified cases such as kidnapping, murder, terrorism, and financing of terrorism, among others, the AMLC may, by itself, issue a resolution to allow its secretariat to conduct a bank inquiry. While the BSP, on the other hand, may conduct such an inquiry in the course of a periodic or special examination of the covered person to determine their compliance with AMLA. Another legal remedy is the freeze order, which seeks to block or restrain the dirty money from being transacted, withdrawn, deposited, transferred, or otherwise moved or disposed of. This freeze order is effective only for 20 days, is extendable for a period not exceeding 6 months, and shall be lifted after the period expires if no case has been filed against the person whose account has been frozen. It is applied before the Court of Appeals and the freeze order may be lifted before the period expires upon motion of the account owner or if the basis for the freeze order has been otherwise lifted for other valid reasons. In any case, while the account is frozen, the account owner may be allowed to withdraw such sums as the AMLC determines to be reasonably necessary for monthly family needs and sustenance including services of counsel and medical needs. Next, we have civil forfeiture which are proceedings aimed at forfeiting the dirty money in favor of the government. 
and these are filed before the appropriate regional trial court through the Office of the Solicitor General after the AMLC determines that probable cause exists that the dirty money is in any way related to an unlawful activity. Finally, we have prosecution of the money laundering offense. As with all other Philippine crimes, it will go through trial with the prosecution having to prove all the elements of the offense charged beyond reasonable doubt. Again, prosecution of the money laundering offense is separate from the prosecution for the predicate crime which gave rise to the money laundering, meaning the predicate crime will be filed and prosecuted as a separate different offense and case. No? Note, however, that AMLA's Section 16 sets forth the prohibition against political harassment, under which no case for money laundering may be filed against and no assets shall be frozen, attached, or forfeited to the prejudice of a candidate for an electoral office during an election period. So that's it for an overview of the Anti-Money Laundering Act of the Philippines as amended together with the implementing rules and regulations. And uh, I will continue this discussion on AMLA in the following episodes. So if you would like to know when they are available, please like, share, and subscribe to this channel. So I hope you have learned a thing or two, and I hope to see you next time. See you soon. Bye.